Hello, welcome to Conversations with WE. My name is Andrea Fallon. I'm the WE co-founder and also director of Change Drug Review. Today, our fellow WE community member, Wendy Liebman, CEO of WSL Strategic Retail, will lead our conversation with our special guest, Christina Hennington. Christina is going to share her professional journey, which led to her current very important role at Target. The WE community is committed to advancing the health and wellness space and developing the emerging talent. This is why we are thrilled to present Conversations with WE. Conversations with WE connects our community with our industry's most remarkable leaders like Christina. These events are accessible to everyone everywhere, so please spread the word and join our LinkedIn community. We empowering women to advance wellness. I'll say that again. We empowering women to advance wellness. We also have a website. Um, it's forwe.org, and this is a great resource to access our and get our engagements, events, and our resources. Um, before we get started, if you're having trouble with your audio, we recommend that you turn the audio off the monitor and that you dial in with your phone. Also, this event is meant to be engaging, so we want to hear from you. Throughout the event, there's a chat icon on your computer. When you have your questions, click on that icon, type in your questions, and we will get to them the last 15 minutes of the event. And finally, we want to see how you engage with WE. So if you're watching alone at your computer or with your team, post your pictures to our LinkedIn page. Again, it's WE Empowering Women to Advance Wellness. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to Christina for sharing her executive path. Good morning from foggy, sort of snowy-ish Minneapolis. What would we be expect? Thank you for turning on the weather. I'm Wendy Liebman, as Andrea said, and I'm here with Christina Hennington. Um, it really is thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming. When I, when I thought about asking you to participate in this, I thought about how long I'd known you, and I thought about a few of the things that I know about you, not to make you nervous. Okay. Um, I think we've known each other maybe for a half a dozen years or so, and I think either we met each other across a, an industry board, maybe at Cosmetic Executive Women, or maybe at NACBS, or one of the industry things. But what I came to realize fairly early in the piece, there were three things that really struck me about you. One is you seem to be eternally curious, um, always asking questions, or always just looking like you're absorbing things a lot. Maybe you're just curious and looking at me and thinking, <laughs> really? <laughs> the other was that you really are a good sport. And when I, I don't know about that's not climbing mountains, maybe you do that too. We'll learn that today maybe. But that you are willing to put yourself out there. And I've known when I've asked you to just give me a thought on something or listen to something, I think you go, oh, okay, you know, you are a good sport, here we are. But I think the third thing, and really relates to this, or all of those things do, is that you are incredibly passionate about building talent and supporting people, not just in this company, which is one thing, but, you know, in your community. Um, and that's been really impressive for me. So I'm- Thank you throwing that back at you for the moment. So that was my sort of when I thought, gee, who do we want to talk to at WE? Who will give us that idea about how to live a, a full, if very full life? That was it. So anyway, thank you. The well, long I appreciate and long. that. That's very kind of you to the, say. The long thank and long. You. So anyway, can we just sort of start at the beginning? Yeah. Um, where did you grow up? Go to school? What do you love to do? What are, you know, just yeah. the beginning of Christina. Yeah, no, it's... Uh... The journey starts in another cold place. It, it starts in Norway, um, which is where I grew up and uh, spent my youth in Scandinavia until, um, like many, my family had the opportunity to come to the United States and pursue the American dream. And it was really my dad's enterprise that took us here as a kid, um, but moved to the Midwest in Michigan and the Chicago area in high school. And um, this part of who I am is such a, it's such a big deal to me because being an immigrant and the afforded the opportunities to pursue the American dream is where I developed my 
work ethic, my roots, and appreciation for all the opportunities that have come my way. Um, lived in the Midwest, went to uh, college at Cornell University in upstate New York. Um, you stuck to cold places, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, if it doesn't snow and if it's not requiring down, it's probably not a place that I want to live. Um, but, uh, you know, pursued a, a degree in Spanish literature and um, economics, which aren't really applicable for much besides just learning critical thinking skills and curiosity about the world at large. Um, and so I went into consulting, <laughs> which seems like the, the natural parlay for um, a liberal arts major. Mm -hmm. And I worked in Boston and PricewaterhouseCoopers, and that's how I started my career. So that view now in my office, they always get tired of me. Here's another immigrant, right? Yeah. Always get tired of me of saying I have an immigrant view to things. Mm -hmm. But it is about that, right? It is you oh, yeah. come, first of all, you look at things a little bit from the outside in, but then you marvel at the opportunity, right? In everything you do. Absolutely. I, I think, first of all, you sometimes feel a little bit caught between multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. And so you have your foot in um, both America and the way of grow, the way I grew up in Scandinavian kind of value systems and roots, uh, language and culture that I, I how um, old were you? Sorry, I was nine. Nine, okay. But it's still, oh, it's yeah. still pretty yeah. ingrained, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but then the um, the opportunity that comes with getting a shot to live in the U.S., especially in that 80s when everything was just big and grand. And, you know, I remember like we went all in on the U.S. and bought a Buick right away. Like that was that was the symbol of the cereal aisle. I mean, that alone yeah. just said brandness. So it, it does shape your thinking. And it has also helped me, I think, become um, part of who I am today as a leader. And then you went from PwC. Did you come here? No, no. I I um, went to a few startups and technology startups. Um, so that was in the late 90s when, you know, there was a lot of startup activity. If you think through the waves of technical um, development in Boston was kind of known as Silicon Alley, not Silicon Valley. But I went and worked for startups and I ran the um, product teams and had engineers reporting to me and, and really um, did understand the kind of the technology infrastructure, but it wasn't my passion. I liked, I knew I liked consumer facing um, industries and um, more business problems than just technical problems. And so I went back to business school at uh, Kellogg at Northwestern, um, got my MBA. And that's where Target recruited me from to become a buyer. So how did you figure out that you were more interested in consumer facing, people facing than yeah. the widgets? Well, so when I was a consultant, which is a very generous term for what you really are, which is um, a code slinger and a uh, grunt, you know, when you first start out your career, well, my clients were consumer packaged goods companies. In fact, many of my vendors today were my early clients. And I would sit in the meetings and I know I was supposed to just be thinking through the technical stuff, but all the interesting conversation was happening about the business stuff. And, and I had um, others who were responsible for that, but I took note of where my passion was ignited and how um, I wanted to jump in and, and uh, participate in that conversation. It also helps that my dad has always been in in products that you know in business that you know he'd always talk about it and mm -hmm. I always liked it. Yeah. So is that that sort of home influence as mm -hmm. well as that work influence? Yeah. You know what what are the what then made you go to the to a tech startup? Well, because I was doing technology at right. PwC and my uh, partners at that um, consulting firm were liking the work I was doing, they went and started these technology firms and they just asked me to come with them. And so I liked the cultural side of the startup world. I liked the idea of wearing my rollerblades around the office. I liked the idea of having a beer <laughs> once in a while, you know, after five uh, or, or nine, um, more like it. <laughs> right. um, and so that was fun too, like mm -hmm. just in my life stage that I was in, in my 20s and, and the the culture, the opportunity to create, the opportunity to build acumen in the digital 
and technical world I thought was valuable um, and is something that I've continued to leverage yeah. in my in my current career. So then you come to Target mm -hmm. in, when was that? Early 2003. 2003. Okay. Yeah. And as a, buyer, as a buyer. On what category? I started training sporting goods and I was okay. placed in toys. Okay. Yeah. And how, what did that world look like? How did you figure that one out? Uh, you, you, you just come out of Northwestern with a, yeah. your MBA. Yep. Right. And? Well, so that was, that was um, very fun, honestly, because first of all, Target had never recruited for MBAs for buying. We always had for finance, but never for merchandising. And so I was the trial hire uh, from business school. And um, so Target didn't really know what to do with me. They just said, go figure it out. And so there was no training or anything like that. But I had always been kind of put into go figure it out situations. When I moved to the US, they just put me in school and I was like, I guess I got to learn English, you know, and <laughs> figure it out. And um, so that didn't scare me. That was actually that challenge was invigorating, but the idea of the role itself was what attracted me here. Um, having an opportunity to run a P&L, having an opportunity to influence a broad swath of categories versus the narrow um, uh, focus that that uh, I'd had before. The opportunity to work with vendors, and then toys was just a really good area. It's trendy, it's seasonal, it's import, it's domestic big national brands and small niche um, players. And so it was a great training ground. And I figured, you know, I'd be at Target a couple of years and I've never been to Minnesota, but a lot like Scandinavia. Right. So, you know, it was cold down, leave. <laughs> right, snow, all of those um, things. Right. And then I figured I'd move on and do my next thing. Yeah. But I, 16 and a half years, I'm still here. Yeah. So what, what amazes me about that is they said, so go and figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So here you are. So now you're in the toy role. Mm -hmm. How did you figure it out? Well, I will say there are amazing people at Target. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity to be paired with um, an onboarding mentor, a, um, I had amazing leaders who just were good at teaching the disciplines of merchandising, but also of leadership. And, um, and so it was figure out how to be effective in the role but it wasn't without support um, around me. Um, and some of the early leaders that I worked for became my mentors over time. And then the idea was that the work itself wasn't radical. It was about trying to figure out what consumers wanted, choosing products, leveraging the four Ps, like I've been taught in business school, and, and be responsive to the market. Um, by making sure that the numbers all come together. And so it's fundamental business um, and you learn by trying and you learn by practicing. And the thing about toys um, that I learned quickly is as long as you have more wins than losses, that's okay because you're gonna call things wrong. Um, you're just not gonna get the kids into the kids' psyche and figure it all out, what's gonna hit, but you just have to be able to um, get more winners than losers. And learning that fairly early in my career was also a good thing. That it's failing as part of, you know, it's going to happen to all of us. It's how you respond to it and how good of a plan you have in order to insulate yourself from that failure, failure being disastrous. Do you think that's um, something that comes particularly in a, in a business like retail, which is incredibly fast, and whether you're on sort of the commodity consumable side or in something as trend driven as toys, do you think it's unique to that or more unique or is that even good grammar? Um, I know it's not unique, well, whatever. Yeah. Um, versus when you, what you saw from the consulting side, do you think retail has a, makes it even more intense when you think about failure, winning and failing? Yeah, I think retail by nature is, like you said, it is so fast paced that you know by definition you're going to make some mistakes because the consumer is moving so quickly, but the opportunity to recover is also there um, because trends do move so quickly. And so um, I have come to love retail for many reasons. Um, one of them is the dynamic pace. The other it's the breadth and the, um, specifically target, it's the people. And then fourth is just the consumer influence and impact. You know, you think about things we need every day um, whether it's you know dog food or 
paper towels to the things that you didn't know you needed. Um, and we see that as our job to make sure that you are just sparked enough by the imagination that suddenly you needed something that we put on in here. Yes, that's the $200. <laughs> yeah, that's I just the, came in to get that's diapers. Well, maybe not me, yeah. but yes, the expect more yeah. surprise. Right? right. So you've had lots of roles at Target, right? Yeah. And I think I've had 11. 11? Yeah. Okay. In 16 years? Yeah. That either means you're incredibly fickle. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, so how did they come about? Was that sounds a stupid question. It feels was that was that a very planned process? Um, is that the nature of this company? How did you both take advantage of those things and then put yourself in a position where you said, "Oh, really? Should I yeah. give that a go?" I mean, I think there's a little bit of that at Target in general. We tend to um, value team member and um, development and creating opportunities for people. So when I say 11, they're not all dramatically different. They might be a scope change in a current role. Um, and it's a little bit in the beginning of my career, I took a lot of advice from leaders and mentors who helped me architect um, a path. And so I didn't know what I needed to fill out my toolbox. And they helped me realize that, you know, you're good at these things. You, if you're really going to want to aspire to here, you really need to fill these gaps. And as a result, you should consider thinking about these types of roles. And as I got more advanced in my um, progression, I um, purposely sought out opportunities that would allow me to learn, because I am a learner mm -hmm. and I am curious, mm -hmm. uh, that would challenge my skill set, but that I could still apply the fundamentals of what I know, which is uh, business strategy and team development, which are the things that I always hang my hat on. So you talk about mentors. Were they formally, I mean, I know big companies like this yeah. have a formal mentoring yeah. approach. Were they formal mentors or they were people you sought out? They were both. Uh -huh. They were both. And so there's a bit of formality to it. Um, and there were certainly relationships that I established that were meaningful to me that I wanted to maintain. But as I got older, I realized that my network needed to be broader. And so um, whether it was through industry affiliations, board work, or I was very, very fortunate to um, be part of a fellowship with the Aspen Institute mm -hmm. um, several years ago called the Henry Crown Fellowship. But it was just a massive expansion of my network and access to people who think differently, who are going to challenge me differently, um, who have expertise that I might not have. And now I find that I rely on the external network almost more so than the internal network because it's, um, you know, it's other leaders at the same level in other industries or companies. Yeah. You know, it's always interesting to me because I think about companies that have very formal mentoring programs, mm -hmm. which are wonderful, but they're all often people who aren't, yeah. don't access that or don't have the, you know, they're not high potentials or whatever you call yeah. it. So I often think when we're, for us, you know, for ourselves as a community of people trying to get on, where do we go? We don't have to wait till we're anointed as part of the right. mentoring program. We can mentor ourselves, right? Yeah. Through what things you're suggesting. Well, and that's actually a mistake I made early in my mm -hmm. career is that I got to Target and I had come from consulting where you know, 70 hour work weeks were mm -hmm. common. And I actually associated that with a badge of honor that like the longer you work, the, the cooler you were, mm -hmm. which isn't really true. Right. <laughs> um, and so I worked really, really hard to get up to speed. And I said, oh, you know, networking and having coffees with people and stuff, that's peripheral to what I'm doing here. I need to just, my results will speak for themselves and I'll just and that is incredibly naive, first of all, that your results will just speak for themselves in an organization as big as this. But it's also um, short-sighted in, uh, in the potential to learn from others. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I, I quickly, you know, fairly quickly adjusted my approach to that and, and had a different appreciation for what networking is. Yeah. It's really yeah. about growth, yeah. learning, and um, building relationships. Because the day you need a network is not the day you start networking. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And I, and you know, I, I'm always there. There, are, I hear often from you know people, particularly moving up in in companies, exactly what you said. If I work longer hours, 
and people see I'm here before they get here and I'm here after yeah. they leave, that's the badge or that's what yeah. I'll need to have to be viewed as an up and comer. Yeah. Where in fact that's not the case in most I mean there are yeah. places like yeah. that, right? But not mostly. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. So when when you think about the people around you and the people now you know what you know and, mm -hmm. and clearly you've found ways to keep learning, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that. How do you infuse that within your organization? And your organization is just I don't know, every time I turn around, you've got another title on your, what does your card look like? It's like a concertina <laughs> business card, right? Um, but how do you infuse that within the organization? And do you, second part to that, there are a lot of people emerging in, in your organization that we hear from the next gen uh, on our community who say, why don't they listen to us? So that sort of reverse role. So anyway, that's yeah. a too long question, sorry. Yeah, no, I think your first question is how do we continue to support learning? And I think if you're going to stay relevant in an industry that is consumer facing, you need to acknowledge how massively this industry is transforming. And um, I don't think you have an option to remain curious to what's happening in the world. And so it's embedding, um, it's embedding the practices of insights, research, um, data, inquisitive, uh, um, you know, question asking and so forth into how you operate, creating time and space for that. Mm -hmm. It's also about um, having a culture that supports, you know, pressure testing that from mm -hmm. multiple angles and, and being open to the debate, even if it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and not just being like, well, let's just get make a decision and move. Like, 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 let's sit in this for a little bit um, and, and marinate on the, the options here before we just run to the solution, which can be hard. Yeah. Um, and I'm not by no means perfect at it, but I think this idea of I try to make myself dangerous enough with information that I can ask the questions that sometimes I have to keep my teams on their toes. Mm -hmm. So give me an example of that without revealing any secrets. Yeah, you know? <laughs> well, we have this internal um, data pool, or, you know, or um, where we can access lots of different KPIs and reports mm -hmm. and things. And I will spend hours just digging sometimes into things that, I've, that I'm following a um, trail of mm -hmm. crumbs, a crumb mm -hmm. trail. And I find something that I'm interested in and I will ask it not to try to catch someone off guard, but because I think it's important to a conversation that we had. And so whether it's in a, a staff meeting or in one on one, what do you think about the changing expectations of consumers in this category? I noticed blah, 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 you know, and and that I think helps people think about well, what should I be thinking about? And why is my boss thinking about that? And why is she getting into level of detail on water sports? Right. You know, that, that right. you know. Right. So anyway, um, the second question, I think, um, if I remember it now, it's been a while. Um, sorry, it's, sorry, it's no, about it's okay. I shouldn't I'm have asked you at once. I know better than here. that. No. Um, is, uh, it's really important to pay it forward mm -hmm. uh, and help the, the younger generations mm -hmm continue to advance against their professional goals. And so at this point, I probably spend as much time engaging with them and mentoring and teaching, but I also have a reverse mentor who continues to teach me. Yeah. And um, it's often in, in um, areas of diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and uh, kind of the social zeitgeist of the millennials mm -hmm. and ability to have deep personal relationships where we can trust each other that yeah, we might be of two different generations, mm -hmm. but we value and respect each other. And he will challenge and mm -hmm. tell me how something is coming across mm -hmm. or why aren't target leaders doing X, Y, mm -hmm. and Z or whatever. It's super helpful. Yeah. And then I can give him perspective on how it fits in from my vantage point. And we don't always agree, yeah. but it's very helpful. Is that a corporate reverse mentoring is, is a corporate thing or is that something you developed? For yourself within your group it's something that we have pursued more consistently mm -hmm. across um target but it's something that um started 
you know, in a, in a smaller area in merchandising and supply chain yeah. and has taken flight. Yeah, because I think about that. I think in our, I probably learned so much more um, from, you know, that sort of open environment where somebody comes in and says, could we, I think we should think about this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, that hurts. Do I have to really think about that? You know, what do we have to do? Well, you're uh, so innately curious. I mean, well, you're always asking all the questions. That's, <laughs> that's you, kind of your nature. It, but I know, but when people sort of say to you, can't, I think we should do this, or no, that's not the way they do it. This People, we live this way, and I'm like, really, I have to think about that now? That's really hard. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It is a little stressful sometimes yeah. when you thought you were on a path, and then someone's like, <sighs> Yeah. throws in a curveball and you're like, oh, really? Yeah, wrong. Oh. Now I have to think about that yeah, in a different exactly. way, different kind of way. So as you've added these, well, here's my one question I had on my mind. So you did a whole merchandising run for a while. Yeah. And then still in merchandising, but more on the operational side of right. that. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, that was mind boggling to me, maybe not to you because of your background, but I thought, wow, that is a huge, massive job. And then you move back to merchandising. How was that that shift for you? Yeah. And what drove that? And then what did you love about it? What did you, I know I'm not yeah. allowed to ask you what you hated about it, but what yeah. did you love about it all? And then, you know, yeah. coming back, what? how was that different? I think I realized that I needed to round out more aspects of my skill set. And operations is an area that I like. I'd been in supply chain um, before and, um, I didn't gravitate towards it as my first passion. I really liked running the business and the product side, but it made me a better merchant to have rounded out skill sets on the operation side. So I loved the opportunity, not only because I got to do new things on, like build our flex format strategy, um, which is our new small store right. strategy, um, run teams that just did different things. Actually, the role that I think was most growth oriented was when I ran pharmacies and clinics mm -hmm. uh, because there were experts there who, they were pharmacists, they were um, compliance and uh, legal experts, managed care. I had no idea how to do their job, but I had to coalesce us against a common strategy and be effective in helping them achieve their goals. And so that was a really good growth is leading people whose expertise you don't have and have never done yourself. Um, so I enjoyed that a lot. Um, but then probably the, the biggest role from which I grew the most was leading a major transformation effort for our merchandising organization. So about 3,000 people. We chose to pursue a very different operating model, deleveled multiple layers, changed the way we work, built up new capabilities and planning and visual merchandising and data and analytics and and basically changed on one day 3,000 people's jobs while still running this $80 billion machine. And that from a change management, communication, HR structure, organizational design um, was a really good exercise to go through because there's probably no business that won't at some point have to transform. We can evolve only up to a certain point and at some point it needs to be a transformation or a revolution, most likely. Yeah, and that moment, conscious of our time because we've got yeah. lots of questions coming up, which is great. At that moment, you have to help people in the organization, the 3,000 people, know what their role is or not. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was it was hard, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It was a hard job. Yeah. Um, but I had been here long enough and I cared enough about this organization that I saw the gap in how we were operating today and the feedback from people and the best team survey and the frustration that we weren't tackling the root cause. Mm -hmm. We were really solving just some things mm -hmm. on the edge that if I wanted to have purpose in that moment, my purpose chose to be about well, let's try to do something materially different to change the outcome for myself, but for all the, the people that I care about. And and that is um, that sounds super altruistic or whatnot, but it was it's how I stay motivated personally. That it needs to be something beyond just the face value of what we're doing. So when you look at talent today in the organization, what are you looking for? 
Um, I, well, first of all, I think every team needs to be a mosaic. Like you really do need different strengths and, um, and expertise and background and experiences. And so it depends on who else is on the team, but there are a couple common characteristics that I look for. Um, I look for someone who has the balance of uh, strategic foresight and vision with um, ability to translate that into execution. Uh, I don't, you can't not have that in retail, to be totally honest. I always place a lot of value on team and talent developers um, because we, when you get the team right and they're strong, it's a virtuous cycle. You attract, you get great results, you attract great people, and then you get more and better great results, and then it just becomes better and better. And so, Talent development is an important component. Um, I think uh, I think curiosity, so they stay future oriented. And then it's the rest of the skills need to kind of mix out and match depending on what you have on the team. I always look for people with a high level of integrity at the baseline and, and things like that. But um, and, and generally optimists. You know, I don't like to to yeah. <laughs> come here for those many hours in the right, day. Right. Right and have to like convince people that like we can do this yeah you yeah. know that's, that's great so that that addresses my last question for you before we get to yeah. the, all the questions coming up um how do you juggle this how do you i mean this is the question we hear particularly from you know young millennials old millennials just starting families yeah. or even just single people who want a life right yeah how do you <laughs> You know, you know, I go home and watch Project Runway. Yeah. You know, whatever. What? Yeah. But how do you? Or don't you? British Baking Show. Um, yeah, right. There you go. Um, <laughs> no, I. It is. First of all, there's no silver bullet. Yeah. And it's it's very personal. I I would say I rely on my tribe. You mm -hmm. know, my family. Mm -hmm. I am only as good as my spouse and um, her commitment to our unit, as well as um, our friends that are extended. Mm -hmm throughout um, the, the, the Twin Cities and, and beyond. I um, do think it's really important that you have some values in which you're not allowed, you know, you won't cross. Like, this is important to me. Like, after this, I'm gonna go straight to my daughter's French presentation at school because she's been working on it for a long time and I wanna see it. And it's the middle of the day on a Thursday, but that's okay, you know? Um, and I think, um, being declarative about what's really important to you and then having those boundaries in place and aligning them with the organization that you work with and say, do these fit the values of the organization and are these would these be honored and valued here so that I can kind of jive, you know, at yeah. different times of yeah. year and be flexible, but also uh, n not have to sacrifice yeah. uh, that which is most important. Now, is this perfect? No. Like, do I wish I'd fit in a lot more workouts? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> but is that. it kind of generally yeah. working? Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, so I am going to well, formally I'm going to yeah. say thank you, but now I'm going to let other okay. people in the audience ask questions. Okay. So excuse me, or while I'm sort of squinting at this gigantic screen. Uh, do, 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 do. So here's a question about you've had lots of roles within the organisation. Um, how do you what do you keep your fingers on all the time? I mean, you gave us the example of, yeah, well, I'm also looking in the weeds, so, yeah. you know, keep an eye on that. But when do you stay up here and where are those moments that you feel you need to be in the weeds? Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty situational, but um, okay. I think it's really important to understand um, macro trends um, at, at an aggregate level. So engaging with someone like you where you're where I ask you what do you see what do you see what's going on um, and with partners who also have great access to industry insights as well as our own internal teams keep me grounded in where's the consumer I, who's getting VC funding mm -hmm. um, where um, you know what's happening in the startup scene um, and how is that influencing expectations social media obviously there's there's some trends and things like that but i'd say you know you have to have a strong understanding of macro trends and then the work is really to translate that into what matters 
for us and now. And so, um, you know, at a micro level, I tend to dig into only areas where there's something that really needs to be solved or there's something that just needs, someone needs support. But otherwise, I tend to let the teams run mm -hmm. those parts of it. And so it's, it's, it's not a great answer, but stay grounded in what matters. My job is to translate that into the so what, mm -hmm. and then get out of people's way for the most part, unless you need to help in certain surgical areas. Okay. Right. And and does, do your teams know how do you how do you enable them to know when they can, they say, whoa, now I need to, you know, I, I'm out, I'm out of my depth. Yeah. At that open door that says it's all right if you get stuck here. Yeah. Know when to come. Is that yeah. how do you is that formal or they just know they can raise their hand and say, you know. Well, I hope that they feel that. Uh -huh. I can't speak for them. Um, but you know, try to have an open door policy. I have these new things that I just set up. They're car chats, and so my assistant holds time on my calendar every day when I'm commuting. Right. And of and people can just schedule the car chat. And just having a dialogue, I won't be looking at a deck. There's, mm -hmm. there's no way I can drive and, you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so it becomes a very casual conversation right. and it's not even face to face. So you can just be like, it's a place where people are taking advantage to talk about things that are on their mind mm -hmm. or I'm working through this issue. Can we just talk about it? Mm -hmm. And because it's not formal and it's right. just very, oh yeah, I'm in my car. Right. Like, well, let's talk about that. So, so that's, that's one way. Okay. Um, but it's it's trying to make sure that I'm not so inaccessible mm -hmm. that it feels it would be intimidating to try to bring something right. up that's on their mind. Right. Um, one of the questions that's come up is when when faced with two equally qualified candidates, uh -huh. how do you determine which one to hire? Uh, it depends on what the team needs, mm -hmm. and so they might be equally qualified in terms of their competence, but chances are one has a dimension that would be incremental mm -hmm. to the team dynamic and the other might be more consistent. And so I would try to lean towards the one that would be more complementary mm -hmm. of the rest of the team. Right. So it is that mosaic that you were talking about, certain qualifications that you need, but you also need to keep the, to, to build the team in a way that's powerful. I mean, that's what I aspire to. Right. Is, yeah. is, is that perfect? No. But, but I know that when I hire people on my team that think differently than I am, that might be more, I'm more of a left brain data driven person and I work more with a creative who comes at it from a different angle that I am actually growing. It's actually harder to work yeah. because you don't just naturally see eye to eye. Yeah. But once you figure it out and I have someone on my team like this now, she has taught me lots because she just sees it through a different angle. And so it's been it's been a good reminder. Yeah, it's, it is that thing, right? That if you're slightly off kilter and you have to figure out why that's happened in, in a working relationship, it's actually probably a good thing, right? Yeah, I exactly. think so. It's easy to get stuck in the clouds sometimes. Um, what are the few resources you would recommend to somebody looking to gain insight into becoming a better leader? Um, <laughs> Well, obviously there are lots of books and mm -hmm. there's lots of great TED Talks and there's lots of good um, people that you can listen to and be inspired by. Um, the, the reality is I think we learn most on the job and by doing. And so I would encourage everyone to do some self auditing and inventory of what's important to me. What am I good at? What do I need to build? and then stretch yourself. Don't be afraid. Don't be bold, set aspiration, be courageous in your pursuit and try it. And ask for feedback and get others involved to see how you're doing so you're not just stretched out there, you know, over your skis like flailing in the wind, right. but um but I think it requires doing. Um and so um if there's an opportunity to ask for a project, um, a scope, you know, extension, um, stepping into a non, maybe it's not for the core work, but maybe it's something for the organization as a whole and the enterprise, whether it's 
about talent development, whether it's about culture, whether it's about reputation, whatever, there's so many ways to contribute beyond just your core. And I think a lot of, especially mid-level managers, they wait, and often women more so than men, for people to come to them with here, as opposed to like, I see an opportunity and I know I want to do, so let me let me put a proposal together and, and be bold enough to do that. I think it's, it's interesting when you define that somebody came to me the other day and totally unrelated to our company and asked and said, you know, I really feel I need this experience and my company either doesn't offer it or doesn't see me there and I put yep. something forward. And they said, I was thinking maybe I should go and do some community work that would give me that experience. Yep. Um, That's another way to do it. Yeah, you know, yep. and, and it's sort of philanthropic work, but it's something yep. I'm passionate about. I think I can get that experience there and then bring it back into Absolutely. the company. So I was, it, it was interesting to me to think about how you, this is a very big company, obviously. Yeah. How do you do that and not just wait for somebody to sort of say now, yeah. as opposed to saying, okay, I could figure that one out. Yeah, yeah interesting. Um, this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna now read the last mm -hmm. question, sort of how am I for time? One last quick question. Um, you've navigated a huge company for many years. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give someone starting out um, on how they can avoid being overwhelmed? On the career journey or I guess. just in general? On life. Oh, on gee, life. please. Wow, from, please. I, words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could have was that. <laughs> the career journey. Do, yeah. But. No, but I think, um, you know, every stage of your career will contribute something different. And in the beginning, it is about orienting yourself to kind of the foundation. Who are you as a professional? What do you like to do? What do you aspire to be? And and I'm, it's easy for me at this age to sit and say, like, I kind of know what I want. I'm kind of okay with things that people don't like about me. I've just moved on <laughs> from that. You know, I try to yeah, yeah. get better. But <laughs> but when I, I, you know, when I was 22 or 24, I don't think I remembered all that. Mm. But so being intentional about becoming self-aware of what matters to you and who you are and so that you can be in the driver's seat as much as possible while also becoming just an expert in what you do today. Like, be great. 